I just wanted to say the wonderful thing about Ballina when you come here is people come up to you and they say, you're very welcome to Ballina. And it struck me, do I ever say in Greg Namana, for instance, when I see somebody who's not local, you're very welcome to Greg Namana? Maybe I don't. And there's just a lovely feeling always in Ballina that people here feel that they and do own their town and, and welcome people like me as guests. So I'm very glad to be here. And I'd forgotten until Susan Heffernan reminded us that, in fact, our last lecture was in March 2020. Um, COVID has stolen a, an awful lot of our time. And it makes you even more grateful that you can gather safely, at least we hope so, uh, together uh, again today. You've had a lot of illustrious speakers in this series of lectures, and none more illustrious than today's guest, Ernesto Zedillo. He was president of Mexico from 1994 to 2000. He's an economist by training, and he worked as president to grow Mexico's economy and to improve social equality by increasing spending on social programs. He's also credited with introducing reforms to end political corruption and to create freer elections. And since he's left office, President Zedillo has worked to find solutions to some of the most pressing challenges facing the world today. Following the outbreak of COVID in 2020, he joined the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which is um, an independent body tasked with providing evidence for the policymaking of the future to make sure that countries and institutions can effectively address health threats. He's also worked, and wouldn't you know he's a friend of Mary Robinson's, he's worked on climate change uh, mitigation, and he's been a strong voice on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, and a promoter of global security and peace. He's been a member of the group of former statesmen and women, the elders, since 2013. Since 2009, He's been the director of the Center for the Study of Globalization at Yale University, and there he teaches courses on trade theory and policy, on globalization and the economic evolution and challenges of Latin American and Caribbean countries. Now, in a little while, our former president and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and proud Balana woman, Mary Robinson herself, also an elder, is going to join me in discussion with Ernesto Zedillo about the issues raised in his talk. But would you first welcome our special guest today, Ernesto Zedillo. Thank you. Uh, let me get I need to get uh, my computer and to young people, I tell you this is not to open a Facebook account or Instagram or anything like that. For me, this is a tool of work. Okay, but before, let me see if I can open it at all. <laughs> if not, my son will come to help me. Okay. So, President Robinson, uh, Madam Ambassador, dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to come with Nilda, actually her name is Patricia, you know, a familiar name for you, my wife and my youngest uh, son, Rodrigo, to, to Balina, a place where, as we hear, has a historical connection with, uh, and a very important one, with uh, my own country. I remember with uh, gratitude and emotion when uh, President Robinson visited uh, my country and uh, we went together to visit the monument where we Mexicans pay tribute to the St. Patrick Battalion that sided uh, with the Mexican army when we were defending our country from invaders. But in any case, uh, I am honored and grateful for having been asked by my sister and boss at the Elders, President Mary Robinson, to come uh, before this wonderful audience, all of you, 
to deliver the sixth international human rights lecture of the Mary Robinson Center. In truth, mine will not be a lecture. Believe me, I would not dare to deliver one on the topic of human rights in front of one of the world's uh, champions of the subject, who happens to be none other than Mary. I'm just uh, a lowly economist who used to work uh, for the Mexican government in various capacities and who shares President Robinson's conviction and passion for the human rights cause for which she has worked, fought, and advanced since she was a brilliant young lawyer. On this, as in numerous uh, other topics, Mary is who lectures me, not the other way around. <laughs> what I intend to do today is to submit uh, some considerations about a matter that has worried me, and of course, many others over the years. The subject is the inconsistency that exists between, on the one hand, the generally accepted human rights principles, and on the other, numerous precepts and practices embedded in both international and national laws. Such inconsistency can be outright explicit or subtly implicit, but in both cases represent a challenge and even a material threat to human rights in many places of the world. It would be impossible for me to offer you a full catalog of such inconsistencies. Rather, I will refer to two specific examples that are, in my view, paradigmatic of the problem and that call for distinct, and in one of those cases, for even radical solutions. One example, at one extreme, is about the tension that exists between, on the one hand, uh, human rights, and on the other, covenants that are also seen as inalienable by all countries and peoples. The problem then becomes how to reconcile in practice the validity of two sets of inalienable principles. My other example refers to a case in which some international conventions and national laws uh, as adopted have had as uh, an unintended consequence the systematic violation of human rights along with other odious effects. In this case, the supremacy of human rights must uh, prevail and lead to a thorough revision and even elimination of the legal frameworks at the root of the problem. Before going into the presentations of these two extreme examples, allow me to insist what I presume is unquestionable for you, for you all, and certainly for me that human rights covenants must have supremacy in international and national laws simply because they are essential to the dignity, freedom, and welfare of all human beings. Human rights principles, as expressed in the Universal Declaration, are intended to be generally recognized and respected. Governments are legally obligated to uphold and protect the human rights of all individuals within their jurisdiction. The principles seek to ensure that human rights abuses are not tolerated and that those responsible for such abuses are held accountable. And yet, despite their purported supremacy in international law, Human rights covenants are often violated or simply ignored 
the right to life, liberty, and security of person, the right uh, to freedom of expression and association, and the prohibition of torture and other forms of ill treatment, to mention a few, are rights that in many parts of the world, even in unexpected places, are systematically infringed by governments. Frankly, notwithstanding their supremacy, there is impunity for the violation of human rights. Such impunity can stem, ironically, from the invocation of other covenants in international law, the most conspicuous of these being the principle of state sovereignty. This asserts that each state has the right to govern its own affairs without external interference. This implies that countries have the right uh, to decide their own form of government, being democratic or non-democratic. And this, of course, is a very serious problem because every time that we encounter one of these uh, situations, uh, it so happens that they become defensive and simply say, don't mess around with me because I'm a sovereign country in which uh, I don't accept intervention in my internal affairs. And that, of course, is a very ser serious uh, problem. In fact, the principle of state sovereignty and non-interference in the internal affairs of states is frequently argued to ev evade accountability for violations of human rights. And this is extreme in the United Nations Charter where sovereignty and non-intervention are principles that are accepted and considered of the highest value. Consequently, there can be instances, unfortunately not rarely, when the two important set of principles are in tension with each other and even on a course of collision. As much as people like President Robinson myself, and probably all of you, would like to see the supremacy of human rights principles being uncontested. Absolutely, we must admit that the principles of state sovereignty and non-interference are also universally seen as inalienable and therefore impossible to set aside altogether to remove any obstacle for the enforcement of the, uni of the universal human rights. Instead, we must stay the course, follow over many years, and keep promoting a strengthened political will and commitment from the part of governments and citizens, better public education and awareness, raising sustained advocacy and pressure from civil society and the international community. All of these with a view to achieve a stronger and international and national legal frameworks as well as the pertinent enforcement mechanisms. Although the task to get there still looks immense, we must equally acknowledge and rely on the step stones that have been laid for us painstakingly since the adoption of the Universal Declaration in 1948. The list of these step stones is long to be repeated here. It includes more than 100 instruments comprising conventions, protocols, declarations, codes of conduct, and formal standards. Suffice to mention a few of them, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment on the, of the Crime of Genocide, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Political Rights of Women, the Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery, 
the slave trade and institutions and practices similar to slavery, the convention against torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degraded treatment uh, or punishment, and the convention on the rights of the child. Furthermore, there are institutions mandated to work towards the same end, like the Human Rights Council, unfortunately paralyzed uh, sometimes by its regionally rotated membership, membership that leads to see in the Council rather bizarre participants. But crucially, the world counts with the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, a position in which, as we all know, President Robinson served with enormous distinction. Another promising milestone has been the recognition by the United Nations General Assembly, although yet pending effective implementation, of the principle of the responsibility to protect, which asserts that the international community has a responsibility to intervene when a state is unable or unwilling to protect its own citizens from serious harm. As articulated, the concept recognizes the importance of both human rights and state sovereignty and seeks to find a way to protect both. It is my belief that as long as we do not tire to advocate and achieve stronger rules and institutions, the tension between, on the one hand, the principles of uh, human rights and, on the other, those of sovereignty and non-intervention can be resolved progressively. I am much less sanguine and, to be honest, totally skeptic that in my other example, the tension between universal human rights governance and the international regime in drugs control could be solved unless the latter regime is radically transformed. In a nutshell, for too long, and with few exceptions, drug policies throughout the world have essentially relied on prohibition and law enforcement. This approach is totally inconsistent in my view and in the view of many people with best knowledge from life sciences, sound public health research, and economic analysis. From the larger perspective, which is my profession, prohibition of the production and consumption of any merchandise for which some demand exists under any circumstance, any ways, would lead invariably to the creation of a black market by uh, individuals and organizations willing to violate the law. By decreeing the illegality of the demand and supply of a substance, the state, rather than assuming its responsibility to regulate the market to protect people's health, actually engineers a business that ends up being developed and managed by the worst elements in societies, those willing to violate the law and preserve and expand their market power by means of violence, intimidation, and corruption. Despite the robustness of this basic proposition and of many other propositions from many other significant disciplines, prohibition with criminalization is what most countries use to deal with the problem of production, distribution, and consumption of narcotics. This wrong-headed approach is, <laughs> we must admit, uh, consistent with the single convention on narcotic drugs of 1961, as amended by a protocol in 1972, the Convention on Psychotropic Substances of 1971, and the United Nations Convention against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances 
of 1988. Together, these legal instruments, along with a set of UN activities, constitute the United Nations International Drug Control Regime. In fact, this framework provides uh, international legal cover to the so-called global war on drugs that has been going on for over a century, although in its uh, contemporary form for a bit longer than 50 years. The evidence is overwhelming. The global war on drugs has failed with devastating consequences for individuals and societies around the world. By any pertinent indicator, none of the objectives of the UN international drug regime has been achieved. Let us say it clearly. Prohibition with criminalization is an experiment that has failed brutally. It is not only that it has failed to control production and consumption of drugs, but that it has also had other tragic consequences for public health and human rights. The global data confirming the failure of prohibition is sound and clear, but the disaster can be better manifested by looking at the experience of individual countries. Sadly, a most uh, paradigmatic case happens to be the one of my own country, Mexico, which has modeled its drug policies after the UN conventions and its collaboration with other countries, most significantly the United States. Despite incurring in an incredibly big economic and human cost, Mexico has failed to control the production and traffic of drugs. Rather, the problem has worsened and dramatically so since, in response to the violence fueled by organized crime, the country's war on drugs was escalated in 2006. Five years ago, I worked with some Mexican scholars to make a balance of the war on drugs since such escalation started. Our findings, published in an academic uh, journal, were shocking. Between 2006 and 2017, a quarter of a million homicides occurred in my country. Around 200,000 and uh, 230,000 people were internally displaced and over 35,000 people were disappeared. If we took a stock today, of course those numbers would increase uh, dramatically because the situation has not changed at all. More than 30,000 homicides every year and similar numbers per year of people who have been displaced or disappear continue to happen. In turn, when we review the evidence, uh, we found no evidence that the strategy was working. Uh, no solution for the problem had been achieved at all, and yet we had paid the enormous cost I all refers. By all accounts, the problem has got worse, not better. What we did find was the confirmation that the country's drug policies exist in violation of a number of rights well defined in our constitution for the Mexican people and for other residents of the country. After the peer review and subsequent publication of our study, I decided that it would prove important to go and further explore 
the unconstitutionality of prohibition and criminalization, the two pillars of the country's drug policies, and therefore proceeded to commission a deeper analysis of the subject. Uh, the work produced by two remarkable legal scholars, women I should add uh, for the joy of Mary, <laughs> she thinks that every achievement of humanity in recent centuries and the many centuries to come should be credited to women. <laughs> and I happen to agree to a significant extent with her. Uh, but in any case, the work confirmed our earlier conclusion and actually extended it and deepened it. These scholars anchored their argument on the fact that the first paragraph, the very first paragraph of the Mexican Constitution states, by virtue, I should say, of a 2011 reform, that the Constitution protects all human rights, including in it, in the Constitution, as well as those contained in treaties ratified by Mexico. Therefore, the human rights included uh, in ratified treaties now enjoy constitutional status. Additionally, the Mexican Supreme Court interpreted the new constitutional provisions in a series, series of rulings issued between 2011 and 2015. In those rulings, the court emphasized that only treaties containing human rights uh, norms enjoy constitutional top status. Consequently, there should be no doubt that human rights do have constitutional supremacy in the Mexican legal system. With this principle in mind, our legal scholars examine the laws that mandate prohibition and its enforcement and concluded, based, I believe, on very solid arguments, that Mexico's drug policies violate the right to health, the right to development of personality, the right to equality, as well as the rights to life, personal integrity, personal freedom and security, due process, professional freedom, a healthy, healthy environment, as well as the rights of indigenous communities. Furthermore, they submit that those policies also collide with the constitutional provisions, they call it non-rights violations on market integrity and state management of the economy, federalism and the principles of legality and other standards associated to the preservation of the rule of law. These scholars sharply observe that the rights and non-rights violation of our constitution by current drug policies reinforce one or another, projecting an extraordinary amount of unconstitutional damage to the functioning of the whole system. Prohibitionist uh, drug policy, in their view, that I fully share, violates constitutional rights, prevents individuals from pursuing legitimate life plans, permanently creates inequality, and generates severe and massive damage to the life and health of individuals. Prohibition goes against the health of the Mexican people and disrupts the operation of the Mexican state and clearly is compromising the most structural aspects of democracy and the rule of law in Mexico. Prohibitionist drug policy may consequently be characterized as a systematic constitutional underminer, creating many interconnected normative and practical problems in all social domains. This legal perspective arrives to the same conclusion proposed by the Global Commission on Drug Policy, 
this is a commission established uh, some years ago, of which uh, I would say nowadays four elders uh, form part, President Cardoso, President Gaviria, President Santos, and uh, myself. Uh, and we have arrived after you know, a lot of discussion and after having reviewed the evidence and produced many reports, we have concluded that governments should deal with the drug problem by decriminalizing consumption and regulating, I stress the word, regulating the supply of drugs by means of legal and institutional frameworks that abide by the universal principles of human rights and actively pursue ambitious public health objectives. This reasonable proposition is also supported, in my view, by a proper interpretation of international law. When um, two international law systems clash, as it is here the case, the human rights and the drug control system, international human rights law should prevail. The UN uh, human rights norms must prevail over drug conventions for the former derived directly from the UN charter, charter itself, whereas international obligations regarding drug prohibition are not an expression of the state obligations under the Charter. Moreover, one of the fundamental purposes of the UN is the prom promotion and protection of human rights. And this is not so for drug prohibition. It's about prohibition. Furthermore, many of the human rights norms are pertinently considered of the highest level in the hierarchy of norms in international law. To conform to this conception, it follows that the current international regime on drug control should be reformed. As an intermediate step, I am afraid that the United Nations conventions that now justify prohibition should be rejected, preferably multilaterally, but if not unilaterally, by individual countries themselves, particularly those that are suffering most from the drug problem. This is the right way to resolve the existing and unacceptable tension between the drugs control regime and the universal human rights. Thank you very much. What a fascinating speech, lifting the lid off all that's wrong in human rights in the world. Uh, amazing. I think you should put your hands together again for an astounding government. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have sitting here two learned giants in so many aspects of our lives. And we're going to eavesdrop on the little fireside discussion Moderated by Olivia O'Leary. Thank you, Terry. Um, Ernesto, there'll probably be many people who will have rocked back on their heels at the notion that um, uh, the prohibiting of drugs clashes. With, 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 with human rights. We're probably still in our infancy in terms of handling the drug problem. So can I just tease that out a little bit more? Is there not the danger that if you take the prohibition away from the use of drugs, that you normalize it and perhaps make its use more general? Well, uh, I think that's a, a most pertinent question. Do I need this? Because yeah, you do. I got two. You do, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that's always the first point, and a very important point that is raised uh, in this uh, discussion. 
Uh, and my answer, I mean, will be in, in several uh, stages. Uh, one, there is no evidence that countries that have gone for more, uh, let's say, liberal policies, although there is not a single country that has gone as far as we are recommending uh, in the Global Commission. But in those cases, we haven't seen uh, the normalization you are speaking about. Indeed, there might be some short-term effects on the part uh, of consumption of drugs, if they are, in principle, available. Uh, but uh, I think uh, if governments do their job, which is to assume the responsibility uh, to promote, to support, and to invest in public health, then I am convinced that that risk can be mitigated uh, significantly. Because instead of putting all those massive resources into putting people in jail, uh, then if you put some of those resources, even a minor part, in education, in prevention, in attention who, to people who, for X reasons, uh, have fallen into addiction, I think at the end, the result is uh, most favorable. So that's one consideration. But the other consideration is, as I claim in my remarks, that today what governments do, by virtue of using prohibition and criminalization, is to set the table with uh, a lot of money uh, and opportunities to do business by the worst elements in our societies, which are those who have no ethical or moral limitations to violate the law. You say, okay, that money is there, I will take it. And it's not only about the money, it's also that if somebody else wants to take that money, I will kill him. But when I say this, I'm not being frivolous. I mean, the case of Mexico, or the case of Colombia, and I would say the case of uh, the United States in my own city where Nilda, Patricia, and I live together, you, we have seen fights this summer and last year of gangs fighting with uh, gangs in the street to protect their territory. Because now the US, again, is going through a dramatic, ep 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 <laughs> I would say, epidemic in which, uh, you know, 60, 70,000 people are dying every year uh, for using opioids, uh, fentanyl. And, uh, of course, it's a very attractive market because the growth of the addiction is geometric, terrible, uh, and the market is there, and they are willing to fight uh, for it. Mm -hmm. So what is best to assume that there will always be uh, people that for one reason or another, and I will never make a moral or ethical judgment about that because that will make my argument not legitimate uh, for whatever reason. Well, the responsibility of the state should be first to prevent to the extent possible, and if the situation happens to occur, well, take its public health uh, responsibility, but not try to solve it with something that now we know leads to more violation of the law and fundamentally to massive violations, <coughs> violation of human rights. Uh, so, so that's, uh, I think, uh, part at least of the answer. Mary, um, I mean, the, 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 the terrific thing about what Ernesto has said and the central point to his argument is evidence-based policy. And Every economist will actually go back to that. They'll say, what's the evidence? If the evidence doesn't stack up, then we have to look at a different way <clears throat> of doing it. But is there not a little part of you that quails at the notion of taking away that prohibition? Does it take away a social taboo? Well, as Ernesto was speaking, um, what went through my mind a little bit at the beginning was, 
we had an example that I remember uh, sort of starting my public life in Ireland as a young senator about, which was the prohibition of family planning, the criminalization of buying or selling condoms, mm -hmm. um, and the fact that women couldn't get um, the contraceptive pill unless they, uh, it was certified, they were married first of all, and it was certified by the doctor that they had cycle regulation problems. And you remember, Olivia, we used to joke that the weather must have caused a lot of cycle regulation <laughs> problems because women wanted access. And, and when we realized this is actually a medical issue and we should deal with it as a family planning medical issue, you know, we, we, we learned very, it took nine years for the law to change because we didn't want to talk about it in Ireland at the time. We didn't want to talk about sex. We didn't want to talk about um, that. But it, it was a learning curve. Um, I've followed this um, uh, drugs debate, you know, not as closely as you have, Ernesto, but there's no doubt that the um, approach of law enforcement um, and prohibition has caused huge violence in societies and has caused an undermined, um, a sort of an under, uh, um, black market, if you like, um, a business. Um, you know, the drugs cartels, and they, um, you know, make huge money because of the way the law is. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think it, it is important to uh, understand the, uh, uh, the need for a different approach. Um, uh, it may be that there has to be some element of criminalizing. I don't know, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I certainly think the current system is not working and it is leading to, um, it's leading to a breakdown in societies because of the violence. And you know, you mentioned you know, your own country and other countries in Latin America, and I know this myself from, you know, from, uh, well, from our elders' colleagues mm -hmm. um, talking about it. So are you saying it should be dealt with as a, a health issue? It is a health issue, of course. Addiction. Sorry? And Ad use. Addiction. And use. Uh, and yes, use. and use, yes. A health there issue. are people who consume drugs yeah. and don't fall into addiction. I mean, this is a medical uh, situation. But I think the key point is to speak about uh, regulation. Hmm. I mean, if you think about, uh, you go to a pharmacy, and of course you can buy some medicines over the counter. But those that are behind the counter, practically all of them could kill people if you take them in excess, right? Uh, and yet, that usually doesn't happen because they are being regulated. Because there is a, a medical system behind the provision, the production of those drugs. This is not different. I mean, what we are saying, is, whatever you do with drugs, it should be based on knowledge, on medical knowledge. Uh, and you have to have the infrastructure to manage that system. I mean, governments know how to regulate. Some, some don't know it very well. But uh, most governments uh, should have the responsibility to regulate something and may do it uh, well. So this is the same problem. But uh, I would say if, if people don't like uh, the idea, well, they should think about the consequences of staying the course we have been followed over many years. Well, to come back to your point about evidence-based policy, um, is there any country that's gone far enough down the road of um, decriminalizing narcotics and done it successfully? As I said, no country has lived up to the principle, to the elementary principle, that drug problems should be dealt with as a public health and human rights problem. Uh, I insist very much in the human rights because I have the evidence, the evidence from my country, that the way in which we deal with the drug problem uh, leads to massive violation of the human rights uh, of Mexicans, standing, starting with the right to health, which, which is uh, already, happily, a right in our constitution. Uh, so, and it's not only that, it's uh, actually highly discriminatory 
Because who do you see really put in jail? The poor? You see a lot of women which are used to carry the drugs. And those are caught, but the, the, the big lords of the business, you know, every now and then they, we catch one and make big news. But basically every day it is young people and women who are put in jail. In the United States, it's uh, African Americans yeah. or Latinos, you know, and what has happened in the US is a tragedy. I mean, uh, two million people or more in jail, many of them, with uh, associated to the drug uh, prohibition. So that's really a human rights problem that is not really acknowledged mm -hmm. because this is people who have no voice or not political influence. But the drug lords, you know, at least in Latin America, acquire enormous, enormous political influence for, uh, for one reason that I am afraid and that has, was evident in the past in countries like Colombia, because they start financing political mm. campaigns. Mm. Yes, they get to that stage. And, and we do know from prohibition in the 20s, wasn't it, of alcohol yeah. in America, how that also developed to a big yeah. criminal underworld and eventually was abandoned. Mm -hmm. But how do we get minds around to accepting that this is a health problem? and a human rights issue? Well, I think the report of the Drugs Commission was a very big breakthrough for a start. Um, what was that, a couple of years ago? No, no, uh, well, uh, the story is the following. We first started with a commission on drugs and democracy in Latin America with President Cardoso and other- Also an elder. And, uh, yes. and uh, intellectuals of the stature of Carlos Fuentes, Mario Vargas Llosa, Enrique Krause. We produce a report uh, about Latin America where we say our democracies are, are being threatened and will be further threatened by the drug problem. And we recommended a few rather timid uh, uh, steps, which interestingly then were adopted by the Organization of American States and then taken to the summit of the Americas. And when we saw that actually there were politicians who were paying attention at that moment, we said, well, maybe we should go bigger and global on that. And we created the Global uh, Commission with people from all over the world. And don't think that those members of the, condition, of the commission are people who tend to be progressive or liberal. Uh, they are simply decent people who are very worried about uh, the problem, and some happen to be conservative. You know who were the members, the American members of the commission? Paul Volcker and George Schultz. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, they were never hippies, you know, <laughs> because they, they uh, never consumed drugs. And all of us, I, I don't even consume now alcohol. Uh, I mean, it's not that I, uh, and I don't use the word approve or disapprove, but I see the human dimension of the problem, and I am absolutely convinced that we have to deal with it uh, in a very different way. And I am first to admit that during my time as president, whatever I did uh, was very modest. You know, I, I knew already what I know, that it was, uh, as an economist, I know that this is a very foolish uh, policy. Because I know that the, the basic theory of how you make a lack market. Uh, but I said, well, this has to be progressive. I promoted a special assembly of the, uh, a special session of the UN General Assembly, uh, which was uh, achieved. But the outcome was uh, very modest. Many years later, again, Latin American countries promoted another uh, special session, uh, but immediately happened what happened back in 1997, that the United States uh, and other countries uh, started to block the possibility of any, of any agreement. <laughs> A few years ago, uh, an ambassador of Portugal to the UN uh, approached me somewhere, I forgot where, and said, Mr. President, 
uh, I want to apologize to you. And he said, why? Because uh, in 1997, uh, Mexico was vetoed by the United States to chair the commission that was going to prepare and negotiate the text to be voted uh, or to be discussed in the General Assembly. And we, the Portuguese, accepted to preside this commission in lieu of uh, Mexico. And we should have said, no, the Mexicans are promoting this, and they should chair the, the preparation of the, of the declaration. Well, I, I found out that a quarter of a century later. And the same happened a few years ago. Well, uh, but I think they are wrong, and we are right, and we should keep insisting. And, and yet one can see how that sort of easy slogan, um, soundbite, uh, whatever it is, you know, the global war on drugs, um, could be used by, and one will not mention any particular politicians in any particular country, um, could be used so easily as a vote getter, as a representative mm. of people who stand for right, clean living. Um, and, and that's, you know, in, in a way part, mm. part of the difficulty, mm. isn't it, Mary? Mm. It is, yeah. Maybe, um, if, if I may, um, uh, Olivia, I'd like to also go back to an earlier point that Ernesto was making, because I want to make sure, I'm not sure if we're on the same path here, Ernesto, I just want to clarify. I, um, the um, uh, principle of non-interference in internal affairs. Um, I don't find that too troubling to human rights, because I think it has been limited by states to really political interference, regime change, um, you know, and, and, and approaches to regime change, because precisely, and you mentioned the number of covenants and conventions and work of special rapporteurs who have a right to go into countries and countries accept. This is accepted by countries. Um, uh, the trouble is, it's not always upheld. That's the problem. Well, th um, then there is not accepted. Yeah, but read the news yeah. about. Look what this dictator in Nicaragua is doing. Hmm. I mean, he's uh, expelling uh, very remarkable people from Nicaragua. Yeah, uh, and and some of them were taken after being in jail hmm. for two years. Yeah, uh, all the candidates to the presidency in Nicaragua were put in jail a year ahead of the hmm. elections. When the election, which was not an election, was over, the man said, okay, now you can go. Hmm. Uh, and a few months later, he said, now those people have no nationality, deprived of their nationality. Hmm. And of course, he is in violation of uh, many covenants yeah. on human rights. Uh, and you know what has been his response? Uh, Nicaragua is a sovereign country, and we are not going to accept any criticism. We are just applica applying our laws. Uh, I don't know which laws, but the law of his wife, who is worse than him, right? <laughs> so you see, there are bad women after all, Mary. Oh, I, I, okay? I accept that. Believe me. Uh, uh, but no, as we yeah. speak, it's happening. You yeah. know, the Chinese... Uh, well, Putin now, I mean, uh, isn't he violating basic human rights? Yeah, but like he's invoking sovereignty yeah. of Russia to yeah. defend itself. Yeah. <laughs> but, From who? Yeah, but what, you know, what we learn um, you know, at the international level, um, the human rights level, is um, it's always a struggle. And some countries go through different periods. I mean, I was lucky uh, when I was um, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights um, in um, my relations with China. I mean, I made several, I made six working visits to China. I met with the then President Jiang Zemin three times that we discussed, and China both signed up to both covenants. They signed both the covenant on international, international covenant on civil and political rights and the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And during my term, they ratified the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights with one reservation, I think it's Article 8, um, no free trade unions, but otherwise, because they were proud of what they were doing and bringing people out of poverty. And as, as High Commissioner, I was acknowledging that. Um, China now is much more difficult, far more difficult under the current president, there's no doubt about that. Russia is much more difficult, but that doesn't mean that, mm -hmm. and you know, what, what always 
inspired me, Olivia, in that those five years as High Commissioner and still inspire me is the people who work locally for human rights and who work so hard. They're working at the moment in Myanmar, um, working very hard for human rights in an impossible situation and in Yemen, which we've almost forgotten about. But there are people on the ground who are working for human rights and who are trying. There are teachers, there are um, you know, doctors, there are lawyers there are, who, who don't give up. And um, you, know, you see when they get the right to, a, to, to an election, uh, you know, the, 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 the right to a free election when you haven't got that, the queues um, of people, yes. you know, yes. things that we take for granted. In, indeed, I remember seeing it in El Salvador, people mm. queuing up to mm. vote for the first time, yeah. even though the opposition had been exiled to Miami, mm. but mm. they still went and voted. But just can I come back? Is there a difference then, Mary, between you and... No, I think I, it's so? full agreement. I think Mary, for the first time well, in her life, I is supporting <laughs> me because I said two things in my presentation. You say, uh, on the tension, between the inter, uh, universal uh, principles mm. of human rights and what is in the chapter, the in the charter on sovereignty and non-intervention. Uh, fortunately, we have built over many yeah. decades, and she's one of the architects. I said, a step stones. Mm. You know, practically from the moment the declaration was uh, adopted in '48. Mm a number of instruments have been uh, produced. Sometimes uh, they work, and sometimes you find uh, walls against which uh, you hit. And I said, no, we are not talking about a revolution or a radical transformation in this case. What we need is to keep the pressure yeah. to get uh, even stronger rules and better mechanisms of enforcement. And also I said that there was uh, an outstanding high commissioner uh, for human rights, uh, who was Mary Robinson. <laughs> so there is a proof that you can make uh, progress. In the other case, frankly, if we keep uh, the existing system, uh, either you uh, reject the system and do what you need to do to have better policies, or you get together with other countries and reform the multilateral system for drugs control to do the right thing. Mm. But simply the existing system is unacceptable. We must reject it. Yes, you're talking about drugs now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. In the other yes. case, yes. no, let's use what has been built yep. and keep pushing, pushing with civil yep. society, mm. with governments, with... Uh, with, with progressive business. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, because, I will yeah. call it progressive realization <laughs> of the ideal of human rights. Yep. Yes, still it strikes me, Ernesto, that you may be a little bit more pessimistic about the non-intervention and sovereignty issue than Mary is. No, I think, I, I, I think the, the principle I believe in, mm. how, as a Mexican, I do believe in, in sovereignty and non-intervention, a country that lost half of its territory to foreign intervention should believe Hmm. Uh, in non-intervention, yeah. and I think it's important, but I, but I believe in the supremacy of human rights. Hmm. So we must find a way uh, to reconcile the two principles. And I mentioned in my uh, remarks the responsibility to protect, hmm. which I think uh, in terms of ideas uh, is the most advanced country. Hmm. Say, so yes, we believe in sovereignty, but there is a, pro, uh, a moment in which if a country simply is doing nothing to protect uh, its uh, population uh, and there is a massive violation of uh, human rights, then uh, sovereignty means nothing because sovereignty emanates from the will of the people. Yeah. And if you don't care about people, then you don't have sovereignty, mm -hmm. period. I, I don't think we, we do um, disagree. I think what we do know, because we recently had our um, meeting in um, South Korea in Seoul, because uh, Ban Ki-moon, who was actually my boss for three mandates in the UN, he was my boss for my mandate. I was the special representative of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for the Great Lakes in Africa. And then he switched me to climate before the Paris Agreement. 
And then in 2016, he gave me another climate mandate for El Nino and climate, because the El Nino was so serious. And sadly, we're heading for another El Nino um, this year. It's, it's already started. Um, but um, what the elders, what, what we certainly concluded, I think, at our meeting in Seoul is we look at three existential threats. We look at the climate and nature crisis, we look at the nuclear crisis, and we look at the pandemic crisis. And Ernesto, as, you, uh, as was said in the introduction, is, is an expert on that area as well uh, as, as the nuclear and the human rights. Um, but um, uh, in all three areas, we're seeing a lack of uh, you know, adherence to the rule of law and the, uh, you know, the basis of the multilateral system. In other words, it's more fragile than it was. Um, that's just the moment we're in, and that moment could be aggravated by uh, artificial in intelligence on the dark side. Artificial intelligence, as Ernesto said very forcefully at our meeting, has great opportunities, there's no doubt about that, but also more of a dark side. So I don't know whether you want to comment on our, um, on our views at, the, um, at, at our recent meeting. Things have become more difficult. <laughs> yes, uh, we are true believers in international cooperation. Uh, but we believe in international cooperation not only because we believe uh, in international solidarity, which is important enough. We believe in international cooperation because we acknowledge that there are issues or problems that cannot be tackled by a country alone, no matter how powerful that country is. We need cooperative uh, solutions. That's the main reasons for existence of the multilateral system. And in the tricky issues that uh, Mary mentioned right now, uh, we are not going to be successful unless there is a effective uh, international cooperation. And that's what multilateralism is uh, all about. And our fear is that the multilateral system now, for many years, has been cracking. All we have seen is uh, breakdowns. The nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation system has been cracking over the last uh, 22 years, since 2002. Uh, the United States, by withdrawing from the ABM agreement, or Intercontinental Ballistic Defense Systems, started a new race, because the Russians responded, uh, and then the Americans responded, and to this day, we have lost a number of instruments that were very important. If we speak about climate change, well, yes, we have produced, uh, you know, a number of declarations, uh, including, of course, the Paris Agreement, which has been the most significant. But if you ask me as a student of uh, climate change and as a student of uh, the economics of uh, international cooperation, whether we have a system to mitigate uh, climate change to the extent that we need, my answer has to be clearly no. We don't have that system. The system is still to be, mm. to be built. You ask me, is the world, has the world learned the lessons uh, that life gave us uh, a few years ago and have started to get ready for the next pandemic, which could happen tomorrow? My answer would say no, we are doing nothing. Nothing, not a single recommendation provided by the experts after the pandemia in terms of procuring the necessary international cooperation is being adopted or implemented. What were the, what were the big things you suggested? Hmm? What were the well, big first, things? you know, you need to have the authority to coordinate, yeah. right? To say, when you see the signal and this is uh, up to the doctors that work on that. Listen, there is a, a new patho pathogen that, in the case of uh, COVID, 
can be transmitted in the air. This is not Ebola that uh, you have to be close to the person. This is transmitted in the air. This is very dangerous, what we had with COVID. And that can affect the respiratory system in even a fatal way. Well, the risk of pandemic is evident. And we knew that in January. And the pandemic was declared only in early March, mm. late February, mm. right? And it took months and months to do what was needed. And, and, and the dramatic thing about this is that, number one, we knew that it could happen. For decades, we have known that it had happened. Uh, we had insisted over and over again that we needed international cooperation and coordination. And by the way, after SARS, the international health regulations were reformed to get ready for, for that threat. But you know what? A country signed to the international health regulations and then refused to be checked whether they were executing the international health regulations. So the system was not fit for the purpose in principle. But even worse, countries were not complying with the obligations that they were subscribing to. That is to say, they were not abiding by the principles and rules of multilateralism <laughs> in this area that they have accepted. And you ask me today, well, we don't have uh, the financing, we don't have the governance, uh, we don't have uh, the necessary elements to respond to the next pandemic. Fortunately, we have science, yes. you know, science, and uh, it was like a miracle, but it was not a miracle. Behind that, there were many you know, uh, the scientific revolution we had gone through and delivered the vaccine in a, in a few months. But, but that was partly because of SARS, wasn't it? We had yeah. learned so much from, from SARS. Well, well, one of the things that I learned, if I may, um, yes. uh, listening to Ernesto, listening to Gru Brundtland, former director general of the World Health Organization, um, to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who dealt with Ebola in Liberia, um, listening very carefully, one of the very important things is a pandemic is not just a health crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a whole of government. It's an economic crisis. It's a, um, a life, you know, life and death crisis. And it's no a poverty order. crisis. Yeah. It's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And we have the elders, um, uh, at least uh, the three elders who were part of the, uh, no, two of you, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was a co-chair and you were a member of the um, big um, uh, commission that reported on how to deal with pandemics and we recommended a high-level health body of heads of state mm. not health ministers but heads of state it is very difficult to get that and we're going to have a summit in the UN General Assembly week in September um, and there will be a thing, and we are very pessimistic about <coughs> the willingness of heads of state to see it is their responsibility in, you know to really um, uh, be part of a threats council, a high-level threats council is what we've called for, uh, mm -hmm. that goes beyond health, and then reinforce the World Health Organization. Yeah. And it, I know it's a big <coughs> subject to introduce at this stage, and we are coming to the end, but I think for most of us waking up in the morning these days, one of the biggest things on our mind is migration, migrants, unfortunate people trying to cross the Mediterranean, um, people arriving in this country fleeing war or, or discrimination of, of some sort. Coming the the back, Ukrainians in the audience. The Ukrainians in the audience who know better than anybody really about it. But just, Ernesto, to bring it back to what you were saying uh, about sometimes the, uh, the tension <clears throat> between, say, sovereignty, uh, non-interference, and then on the other side, human rights. Doesn't this whole migration uh, crisis at the moment raise the whole issue of what sovereignty is? Do we have a right, any of us, to close our borders or to put a cap on the number of people coming in when this is a human rights versus a sovereignty issue? Well, yes, you know, there are, well, many things, but there are two things which... Uh, uh, countries uh, don't want to discuss collectively. Uh, in principle, they say migration and taxation. You know, let me... <laughs> well, little by little, 
these uh, ideas uh, have changed. And in fact, we do have instruments uh, adopted by the international community to, that determine some basic rules of behavior vis-a-vis -vis not only uh, humanitarian migrants, as uh, is the case of uh, uh, our sisters and brothers from Ukraine who have migrated for a basic humanitarian reason. They are being attacked by this brutish uh, aggressor, aggressor uh, in their territory, in their livelihood, uh, but also economic migrants. Uh, so there, there is a set of principles that have been promoted at the United Nations. The problem is that uh, some countries uh, have been part of that, uh, but others don't even want to talk uh, about it, and some of those are very important countries. And again, the question is, do you prefer a uh, disorganized, uh, chaotic uh, problem of uh, migration? Or do you prefer to sit uh, at the table and discuss certain basic uh, rules to deal with the problem, including the recognition that if we want uh, a world with less uh, pressure, uh, then we have to be more active in helping others to develop. I think that's uh, essential. I mean, Europe is a neighbor of Africa. And we know that the, the demographics of uh, Africa, so, and we know the demographics of Europe, by the way. So this, there is a reality that is in front of us and very clearly will happen. And if that is not dealt with uh, intelligence and uh, solidarity, and at the same time recognizing that people uh, are worried about that, I mean, Brexit happened not because free trade. I mean, the Brits believe in, in free trade, but it was uh, the threat of the demagogues that Britain was being invaded by the others uh, that really led people to support uh, Brexit, which was, you know, a total false uh, argument. <coughs> and now we see the consequences. Just on the, uh, on the migration, um, Olivia, I think it's good that Europe, the European Union, is coming to um, a much more <clears throat> equitable solution <clears throat> because of the so-called Dublin thing where um, you, you had to stay in the country where you first uh, came to. Um, uh, the burden has oh, been carried. Mary, the European Union. Sorry? The European Union <clears throat> has not <clears throat> behaved. It has not, has not behaved well at all, but it has begun, has begun now. Coming across the Mediterranean. Yeah. Basically, what it did was to try to keep them back. Yeah, keep it, them it, in Libya. Keep yeah, them and it's still time. trying to. Yeah. But, um, and I, you know, I, I, I've been very critical, but what I'm saying is I now see at least the beginnings of a more equitable approach by... Um, uh, if you are not in a position to take more, you pay 20,000 per migrant now. I mean, that, that is a new way of beginning a process. And, you know, we have to learn to manage migration because uh, one of the things that will um, accentuate the number of people who have to move, who literally cannot stay because of heat or because of flooding or because of their islands have disappeared, will be because of climate change. I mean, the, the predictions for um, the numbers in 2050 are very frightening in some ways because we are not managing the, the numbers at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's partly because we, we forget our humanity. And when we have experience of people coming into the country, I think it helps a lot because they bring their humanity with them and we understand better. And, we, you know, and Europe has responded to the crisis and conflict the aggressive war by um, Putin on Ukraine, um, with much more humanity towards those migrants, which is now raising a kind of racist issue, because it is not, it's now trying to get Tunisia to agree a kind of, um, to block more coming from the, the countries that go through Tunisia to get, um, which means African countries, mm. and it already it has Egypt um, being paid to keep migrants there, and, and, and this is 
Um, this is kind of raising a very real issue. Um, a counter to that that I'm hoping will become more effective, and it's a very interesting counter, is there's a very significant African Europe foundation that has been created. Um, it's the child of four other foundations, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation for African Leadership, Friends of Europe, the One Foundation of Bono, and an African Europe Foundation. And that is um, an Africa Europe Foundation which is trying to change the relationship between the continent of Africa and the continent of Europe. And I took part very recently in Nairobi in a meeting, a weekend, where we did a lot of discussion, and a point was made which was very interesting, that Africa actually needs Europe less now mm. than before, because it has options of China, it has options of Russia, it has options of Turkey, for example. Um, you know, like, whereas Europe needs Africa more. Mm. Okay. Now, that makes a better relationship to think in terms of what the relationship is between the continents, because that means our, our Europe will be looking to the young, um, intelligent, you know, bright people out of Africa who will need to migrate, um, not permanently, hopefully, circular migration, sure. the, the, the kinds of exchange, and the kind of managing much better of migration. It's a huge topic, and I agree with Ernesto that we have not managed it well up to now. The signs are not really particularly good, but I was trying to point to one good thing. I, I, I agree with you. Um, the European Union has a bad record, yeah. um, but it is beginning to face up to its responsibilities, and I think it absolutely has to, because this is going to be um, a very big issue because of the climate crisis. I just a last question to both of you before we finish. You have both been presidents. You have both been politicians you have both perhaps found yourselves sometimes not able to say what you might have liked to say because it wasn't allowed or the government wasn't going to like it or you had to win an election or whatever. But I'm just listening to Ernesto today talking about um, a radical rethink on handling the drug problem. And I was just going to ask you both, is it sometimes easier when you're older to be able to say things because you're less threatening, you're not involved in the game, but there's a certain amount of wisdom involved. Well, I will claim to have wisdom, number one. Uh, that's very important. But evidently, when uh, you have public responsibility, uh, you have to be careful, not because you want to protect uh, your political future, in my case, it was obvious. Fortunately, Mexico has uh, no re-election, although some people <laughs> sometimes dream about it, stupidly. Uh, but uh, it, was, it is clear in Mexico that once you are president, uh, you will never be president again. That's great. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you have to be respectful for everyone's ideas. I mean, you have to be, you have to say things in a way that you don't think you are totally wrong or you are this or you are that, because that divides a country. That uh, manichaeism of saying there are some people who are good and others who are bad, and you start to demonstrate that attitude in every action. No, in my case, you have to, I thought, no, you, you have to give some reason to everybody because I am sure, at least my mother taught me, that everybody has a good reason always. Mm. Uh, not because they don't think like you, they are wrong. And actually, it is you who may be wrong. <laughs> so you better learn from, from the others. So of course, my, my way of saying things is different now. Now I am a professor. And actually, I am paid to speak like this, <laughs> to be critical, you know, inquisitive, to question. That's what academia is uh, all about. And of course, I am very happy that, uh, that they pay me to do what I like to <laughs> do and, what I, and the way I like to, to be. But of course, when you have public responsibility, you have to be extremely careful and respectful. And that produces a different hmm. way of communicating and expressing your opinions. 
And I, I, I do think briefly, um, Olivia, that, that um, uh, you know, elders can speak in a way, um, and we do it, uh, I think we do it with no sense of ego. It's, it's uh, you know, um, if you take, for example, Ban Ki-moon, you know, he was a very hardworking, very committed um, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. A criticism of the, him that has been made is that he wasn't strong enough in speaking up for some of the issues and speaking to governments more bluntly because he was Asian. But he concentrated a lot on the two areas that he can call his legacy in a way, the Sustainable Development Goals, and I always wear the badge for the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Climate Agreement. You know, huge steps forward, etc. But now he speaks uh, in a way that he didn't speak and he calls out governments and he speaks very independently. And on, for example, the climate crisis at COPs, at COP26 um, in Glasgow, COP27 in Egypt, and it will be the same at the end of this year in the UAE, I will be there as chair of the elders calling out governments. And the journalists now look to the elders, to what is going on behind the scenes. And we get the information, it has to be evidence-based, but are prepared to call out because that is part of an independence, you know, that uh, I'm afraid, like Ernesto, I do quite enjoy. I'm sure you do. <laughs> but I just want to make one last point. Um, when Mandela brought the elders together in 2007, the one thing he did emphasize was that we had to bring hope, that we had to, and, you know, um, I don't think we've necessarily done that enough at this thing. So, um, I think you should ask Ernesto what brings him hope before we conclude. She's because, always telling me you know. what to do. Ernesto, <laughs> what do you think would bring hope? Well, I, I think, uh, <laughs> of course, when I think long term, and I think what was uh, the world and uh, humanity 200 or 250 years ago, and I see where we are today, and I say, oh, I am so happy to be part of this uh, humanity, so full of amazing achievements. So I believe, yes, uh, humanity can uh, still making progress. Uh, I know it takes time for ideas uh, to become, uh, you know, acceptable for many people. I mean, who believed in democracy 300 years ago? And now it has become, you know, a universal value. Who believe in human rights, by the way? Uh, really, or women's rights. Uh, or women's rights. I mean, uh, <laughs> most countries, in most countries, women could not vote when I was yeah. born. When I went uh, with, uh, to university, uh, my wife and I basically went at the same time, uh, the minority were women. Now they are majority. <laughs> I mean, I could list uh, many things that when I was a, a child, I never imagined uh, could happen in terms of science. Of course, that gives me enormous hope. But I also recognize that uh, that hope cannot uh, materialize if uh, we don't continue to do what uh, we are supposed uh, uh, to do. And uh, at the center of that must be human rights. Mm. Read the 30 rights specified in the declaration, in the Universal Declaration. Live by those 30 principles, and I think that will be the key for humanity, prosperity, and happiness. Unfortunately, not everybody believes so. Do you know what I carry in my handbag? Good. The Universal yeah. Declaration of Human Rights. That's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> so for our two elders, still hopeful, still making waves, I'm just going to ask you to give another big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.